radio frequency uh, or electrical pollution or electrical smog at a conference in, in Colorado and uh, was introduced by an airline pilot. Now, he set me on a path that led me to Dave Stetson and uh, Professor Graham. And what I liked about these two is that they have a passion for helping people and getting people to understand how their personal environments in their homes and their workplaces could actually cause degenerative disease. Now, uh, Dr. Graham was found very fascinating because he became my um, telephone mentor, my professor outside of school. He spent hours at a time talking to me about electrical pollution. But what I found out from Dave was that he didn't believe any of this stuff many, many years ago. He thought this was all hogwash. <laughs> Until he thought, Dave said to him, there is some validity to this stuff, which you'll find out this evening. I spent some time with Dave Stetzer, uh, who has uh, been involved with radio frequency uh, for quite a long time, and I found it to be very, very fascinating. So I went to uh, Madison, Wisconsin, spent some time at his laboratory, and found out some amazing things that you're going to find tonight. So listen, be open to this stuff. It's absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm very excited to bring you uh, uh, Dave Stetzer and Professor Graham. Uh, I'll make one little correction. Here's Dan. Actually, Martin didn't think it was hogwash. <laughs> so, so. But what I want to talk about is electrical pollution and radio frequency energy in your health. Um, we want to talk about electrical pollution. Where does it come from? What are the effects of electrical uh, on electrical equipment? What are the effects of it on humans and animals? What has to be done to control it, and what we can do. First of all, where does it come from? <laughs> Basically, what we have is 21st century technology, and we have 19th century distribution system. A little history here. Uh, in 1972, you'll, most of you remember there was an oil embargo, and we had to get more energy efficient. As a result, we created devices that use current and short pulses. We started making things like variable speed frequency drives, like dimmer switches, computers, TVs, and other modern electronic equipment came into play. Uh, we're not going to make everybody into electrical engineers here, but <clears throat> you can see prior to 1972, what we call linear loads, the loads were mostly linear. They were light bulbs, motors, and electric heat panels, things like that. And so this is like a voltage sine wave here, and this is the current, and you can see it flows linear, linearly. Okay, so if it goes through a resistor, motor, or capacitor, it's a phase shift. But in other words, when the voltage was going positive and negative, there was current moving. So then we come along with nonlinear loads, and what happens is we draw current in short pulses. And you can see this is the voltage, the waveform looks the same, everybody's seen that. But now all of a sudden it's like a little switch. We turn this current on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, and these little short pulses. As a result, it creates higher frequencies. So it creates what we call power quality issues. And everybody's had a computer originally when you're seeing a little spike, took it out or something like that. And so Basically, what we're going to call is the power quality we're going to define is anything that deviates from the normal sinusoid. And the normal sinusoid was that nice waveform. Okay, so what are the contributing factors? Uh, there's harmonics, there's transients, sags, and swells. We'll talk just a little bit about it. Harmonics, things like computers, things like that, create extra frequencies. So we have, uh, so for example, the fifth harmonic, you get the 60 cycle sine wave, and you have these extra frequencies here. So it's like, uh, I tell people, it's like if we have five people in a room and we say, okay, you gotta go over here and pick up this glass of water and bring it over here. Well, the next guy has to go over and get the same glass of water, only do it twice, but he has to do it at the same time, and of course the fifth one has to do it five times, so it's like the fifth harmonic. So in other words, we have these higher frequencies that are moving on the line. This is a gateway laptop computer, and this is a waveform, and you can see these short, real sharp spikes you can see how they look, that's the current waveform. So we can do what we call a frequency spectrum or spectrum analysis of it. And we can see here that 100% of the electrons are moving at 60 times per second. But over here, some of the electrons are moving at 1128 times per second. So you see you get these extra frequencies and this is, this is, that's an actual waveform and spectrum analysis. Now here we have a transient and that's like a little spike and of course 
it isn't as high as here, but if the spike was up here, it would probably damage our electronic equipment. At a SAG, everybody's been in a room or a restaurant or sometime where, where some big thing kicks on, air conditioner or something, and the, and the voltage gets drugged down, and you'll see the lights dim for a little bit. It's just a SAG. It really doesn't hurt anything, that, to my knowledge, other than equipment. And the same thing as, as swells. It's a little bit brighter, lights brighten up when a big load comes off the line. Okay, so what do harmonics and high-frequency transient events do? First of all, they cause electric meters to read inaccurately. Your watt meters? Okay, it causes it to read inaccurately. They cause motors and transformers to burn out. They cause neutral wires in a system to overheat. They cause electronic equipment to fail. So you can make the next leap. If it does all that to equipment, what does it do to the human body? We, North America is wired with what we call mostly with what we call a grounded Y system. The system was built in the 30s through the 50s on up. And what happens is we have these three hot wires up here. We'll call them A, B, and C phase, and we have a neutral wire. So what happens is the current goes out on, on these hot wires, and it returns on the neutral. The imbalance returns on the neutral. Okay. So the system was built for light bulbs and motors. So basically, if we have 20 amps in A and 20 amps in B and 20 amps in C, we'll have zero in the neutral conductor. So now, when we come along here in the 80s, 1980s or so, you know, the year of the Pentium was 92, so we put all these nonlinear loads on. And what we do here, it's a different formula for nonlinear loads for calculating the, the current in the neutral. The theoretic is 1.73 times the, the highest phase conductor reading. However, that's in a vacuum and an absolute zero, and we don't have either. So what happens, we come along and using the same scenario, we have 20 amps in A, 20 amps in B, and 20 amps in C, we'd actually end up with 42 amps in the neutral wire. That creates a problem, because there's more amperage going out in the neutral, or coming back on the neutral, than there is in the, uh, the phase conductors. So it's sort of like a suit, you know, I'll use a little analogy here, but I'll, I'll go to that a little bit later here, but what happens is uh, that we have more current in the neutral, so that wire's too small, and it starts to burn and cause problems. So what happens is the electric utilities, by most public service commissions, allowed them to put it in the ground, to use the ground as an extra, the circuit, part of that circuit. Now once it's in the ground, it flows uncontrollably over the ground. Now public service commissions and utilities commissions have called, on, or electric utilities have called, on, and they call it stray voltage. Well, first of all, there's no such thing as stray voltage because voltage doesn't stray. It goes where people put it. Now, the little analogy I was going to talk about, if you had 10 couples and they, lived, they built 10 houses on a hill and they have this two inch pipe coming from their house and they put it into a sewer pipe, four inch pipe, takes it back to the sewage, back to the main sewage plant. Okay, now these 10 couples have 10 kids each. The loads changed on the system. So now we have more toilets being flushed, et cetera, et cetera, okay? clothes being washed, so now we have pressure being built up in the sewage system, the main pipe plugs. There's several ways we can fix it. Most people here would say, well, we dig up the street and put in another pipe, or put in a bigger pipe. But there's one other way you can do that, you relieve that pressure. You can dig up the street and drill a hole in the pipe. It will relieve the pressure. You will have sewage flowing uncontrollably over the earth, and we won't call it stray sewage. There's no difference. What the utilities did is drove a ground rod in every pole and put this current into the earth where it flows uncontrollably. We have another problem. The current gets so it, it gets to be such high frequencies on this, and it has to go back on the grid created by energy efficient lights, computers, etc. That the utilities, the lines start to act like antennas, horizontal antennas. So it actually radiates from the antenna from the wires. Uh, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers recognized this as being a problem back in the 1980s, and they, well, they actually adopted a standard in 1980 called the IEEE 519. They said that these frequencies can be in the radio frequency range, and as such, can reduce harmful effects associated with spurious RF. Spurious meaning bastard or unwanted. And so they actually went ahead, and this, this, they have the recommended practices and how to fix it, and how to repair it, and, and how to, <clears throat> to police it. 
And they made the electric utilities the policemen of this. So it's like saying, Mr. Fox, can you count the chickens in my hen house? And according to EPRI, uh, the situation will get worse, and this was in 1999. Uh, EPRI, Electrical Power Research Institute in Palo Alto, California, said that 70% of all electricity produced in the United States will flow through electronic devices by 2002. So we're a little bit over that. So what are the effects of electrical pollution? First of all, the utility's grounded-wide primary neutral system is now overloaded and obsolete. The earth has become the main path for neutral current to return to the utility substations, and the lives and welfare of uh, people and animals in North America are endangered. Dirty power costs U.S. industry over four to, between four and six billion dollars a year, and that's according to EPRI, and that was again uh, Fortune magazine in June 1999. And I'm sure they didn't take into consideration the health effects of people and money that they've paid. Okay, so let's talk about that ground current for a minute. Where does it flow? Well, electricity is governed by a few laws of physics, and one is the current will travel along the path of least resistance. Now that's Ohm's law, and current will take any and all paths, according to Kirchhoff's law. This here is the photo. I have two ground rods, one here and one here. The power to this farm is completely turned off. There's no power coming into the farm at all. And you can see this distorted voltage waveform here, and that's between about 20 feet apart. And this was in, in uh, Canada. This is a stream. So well, what's in our streams here? Back up here, right here. Okay, this is a nice stream. It used to house or uh, support fish, and the fish don't live there anymore. People were complaining. And so we took a measurement, and we put some shunts in the stream, and we measured it. And this is the voltage waveform in a stream. And you can see the the spikes, and it's not linear. It's not that nice smooth sine wave. It's, it contains a lot of high frequencies. And so again, we can do a spectrum analysis of it. And we can look out here, and you can see that there goes farther, but the 79th harmonic is like 4.74 kilohertz. So you can see that's pretty high frequency. And this is a little thing that we drew, and here goes like from the sub or the power plant is generated, goes out in transmission, goes to the substation, uh, goes out here on distribution, and it goes to your farms and your uh, homes, and so then we come along and the ground current, of course it goes in the ground, and what happens is it doesn't go back on the wire, it just goes back. So anything in its path, including people standing on the ground, it goes through. This is a water pipe, <coughs> and the power to this house is completely off, and we took an ampere and we clamped the water pipe in Madison, Wisconsin. And you can see here, it's 1.88 amps, and you can see it's distorted. Now, according to Riley, who was the head of Johns Hopkins University, and he's written a couple of books, it takes 80 microamps to stop a human heart or to cause ventricular fibrillation. So we have 80, 1.88 amps. That's 1,880,000 microamps. So this is on the water pipes, okay? So it's 23,500 times higher. It isn't like twice as high or three times as much. We're looking at 23,000 times. So here's this plumber that comes along. And he opens the pipe, and he has one hand on one, and the other hand on the other side, and where does that current go? Right across his heart. Uh, EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, did some research, and uh, they found that the, the, the contact current between your sink and your floor, the counter and the floor, that if you have more than uh, 18 microamps, it's a uh, was relevant to cancer. Now this man here, he has prostate cancer. He lives in Canada. And it's 386 times more than what EPRI, the utility's own research center, says will cause cancer. And it, he does have cancer. Minnesota Science Report, uh, 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 Science Advisors, said that 70 percent uh, this was 1998, 70% of all the current that goes out on the phase wires, those hot wires, returns via the earth. Wow. And that was 1998. So, well, what do we do about it? Well, first of all, there are already rules in, in effect. 92D of the National Electrical Safety Code says that ground connection points shall be so arranged that under normal circumstances there will be no objectionable flow of current over the grounding conductor. What part of that doesn't anybody here understand? But if in case you don't understand, they wrote another book. The handbook tells you, interprets it. So it says that 
you can't basically put current in the ground and it's up to the utility to utilizing good design and operating practice to identify and remedy the situation. There's another rule called 215B, objections to the use of the earth as part of the supply circuit are made from both safety and service standpoints. And it says you can't put current in the ground and use it as a regular conductor. It's only for a safety. Instantaneous, you know, somebody hits a pole, something like that. EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, this book came out in 1995. And it said that furthermore, proximity to distribution lines has been associated with the risk of childhood uh, cancer in three epidemiological studies. So it goes on to say we have to get the current on the ground, this is how we got to do it. The book is about this thick, less than a half an inch, and the book cost $25,000. And it's a paperback book. So uh, you can draw your own conclusions from that, but that came out in 1995. A lot of people died of cancer since 1995 and the, the public service commissions are still allowing current to be put in the ground. They didn't reverse their decision that they made in 1992. And if you look at this book, it's stamped by the Wisconsin Public Service Commission okay, Reference Center. So in other words, they know about it, they knew about it, because you and I can't afford to buy that book. Okay. Uh, recognition of effects, the EMFs are a possible human carcinogen, U.S. government, National Institute of Environmental Health and Sciences, the World Health Organization has said that. Um, in 1998, Dr. Neil Cherry came out with a report. He was commissioned by the European Parliament to do a review of the literature, and it said that um, these high frequencies, basically that uh, there's evidence of of biological changes in cells and in animals which relate to brain function change, deep sleep disruption, chronic fatigue, reproductive problems, and adverse health effects such as immune system impairment and cancers of many organs. Epidemiological studies have identified statistically significant increases in the incidence of most of these symptoms and diseases associated with above average exposure to radio frequency and microwave exposure. Now, we're not really talking about that 60 cycle sine wave here. We're talking about what's riding on the 60 cycle. We're talking about the radio frequency energy, the energy that's high frequency. For every 10 studies you find that says power line frequencies cause a problem, you find 10 studies that says it doesn't or it's inconclusive. But you've got to read the studies. But you don't find any studies about radio frequency energy being inconclusive. The EPA came out with two. Um, books and they said that it causes problems and those books were suppressed by utility lobbyists. I had to fly to Washington DC at my own expense and get copies of them from my US Senator. California Health Department, people are probably familiar with that one, EMFs can cause some degree of risk of increased risk of childhood leukemia, adult brain cancer, Lou Gehrig's disease and miscarriages. The doctors, two of the doctors that actually were involved in the research had to actually sue the state of California to get those made public. Schools, you can see that there's a greater increase for female teachers showing higher cancer rates in schools. 72% higher of in vitro, 59% of melanoma, etc. But think about this. You say, well, none of us are teachers. I don't care about the teachers. Whatever. Where do you send your kids? Where do you send your grandkids? Same place those teachers are. Female teachers show higher rate cancer rates. Oh, okay, this is a, the San Francisco B. Um, well, okay, it doesn't say why. They don't know why. Okay, let me continue here and I'll show you. Okay. Okay, radio wave sickness. This is some at the end of World War II. Radar was developed. The Russians came to the United States, a team of Russian scientists came to the United States in Arizona and they met. And they said, we noticed our technicians have the, a set of symptoms here. They have a broadband symptoms, but they're working with transmitters and receivers and they're exposed to RF energy. And we should put standards, set some standards for this. And the American scientists said, well, you know, the beginning of the Cold War, go home, blah, whatever, okay? So they did. So they went back and they made weapons and they actually pulsed our U.S. Embassy with it. But you can see these symptoms. And, you know, I won't go through them, but it's headaches, nausea, et cetera, et cetera. But look at these symptoms. And then Dr. Robert O. Becker in 1980 said, we are now being exposed to frequencies that we've never been exposed to before. They are the cause of the made-up diseases of the 80s. They are the cause of the chronic fatigue, the fibromyalgia, 
the ADD, ADHD. These are the exact same symptoms. And he's saying it's because of high frequencies. So what's in our schools? We measured it. And this maybe will help answer your question here. But, okay, this waveform was collected in, in Canada in a school, and this is a 60 cycle sine wave. So Dr. Graham come along and he said, okay, let's look at this. Let's look at it a little closer. He invented the microscope, so to speak, for electricity. So we take out the 60 cycle. What should be left over? Nothing. Nothing. Right. If we go to Mexico or someplace and we get a glass of water and we drain the water out of the glass, what should be left over? Nothing. But this is like the bacteria. You can see it. And it's like 12.5 kilohertz here. Here's another school. And this one was taken out of Minnesota. And you can, it's 25 kilohertz is actually what, what's here. Go back to this one. And the lady who, the teacher uh, who previously occupied this room died of brain tumors, and the teacher in the adjoining room died of leukemia. We have, um, we'll continue here. This is another school. And you can see we take up, here's the 60 cycle. This is 1 60th of a second from here to here. But look at how many times current's been, those fields are building and collapsing. I went to Kazakhstan, and a doctor there, who is a professor of medicine, Vitaly Resnick, looked at some of these waveforms, he said, can I see them? And, and sure, I let him have it, and he looked at it, and he said, without doing an autopsy or something like that, he can say for sure. But he wrote a statement that said, these frequencies are consistent with what those people died of, the exposure to this, would definitely give them that. So it's sort of like putting, you can see the frequency spectrum, and, and uh, you can look at, like, Here's that 25 kilohertz, but this is a non-ionizing current range, and here's microwave. So it causes heating in the cells and things like that. The Russians have standards, and they say, okay, up to, but not including ki 2 kilohertz, you can be exposed to 25 volts per meter on the electric field and 250 nanotesla on the, on the magnetic field. Above 2 kilohertz, you're only allowed 2.5 volts per meter. Why? there's not 10 times more energy. The reason why is because anything above 2 kilohertz, actually it's 1.7, that energy dissipates internal to the human body. If you made the body into an electrical component, it would look like a capacitor and some resistors. And so that energy would go internal to the body. So of course it's going to take less to do more damage. Okay, so we've done some research myself. Martin Graham, Dr. Martin Graham, Dr. Donald Hillman, Professor Magda Havis from Trent University, Dr. Art Hughes, Nicotina Valentina from, from um, St. Petersburg, Russia, Dr. Vitaly Resnick, Dr. Yuri Gregoriev. And we've done some research now, it's been about eight years since we've been, the three of us, or four of us, that bunch of us have been together. And Dr. Graham's written several white papers we put together, we produced uh, 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 some videos, a documentary. Uh, Dr. Hillman's written a lot of things. We also went and we did some research on cows. Dr. Graham was in, in, uh, involved with cows, and I only got involved for just a short period, and then we had, that's our disagreements, uh, because he wanted to do work on cows, and I said, oh, I want to do work with people, because nobody cares about cows, they buy their groceries in the store. So he said, well, you help me with the cows, I'll help you with the people, and it was the best thing we ever did. So, but to get here, but. So we did some work with these cows, and we measured this dirty power, or this high frequencies on the line, and we counted those spikes, and we had to count the spikes. And what we found was, the more, and I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know the results of, but we just proved it, that's all. And we got 500 and some days worth of data. We did research on over 20,000 cows, and if somebody wants to come to my office, they can count the legs in the films. We filmed them and moved and everything else. But what we found was that the more the cow got shocked, the less milk she gave. The less she got shocked, the more milk she gave. And on days that she got shocked an awful lot, she gave a whole lot less milk. And on days that she didn't get shocked too much, she gave a little more milk. But what we also found was people. The days that the cows gave a lot of milk, people were over-medicated for high blood pressure problems, for sugar diabetes problems, things like that. So then we started moving more into the people after we got that. And so the days the cows gave a whole lot less milk and mental depression and things like that was, were more prevalent in these people. So basically, then what happened is we wrote these scientific papers on it, um, had a hard time with the utilities, 
control, let me control, but there's a university, Burchard, a man named Burchard did it up in, uh, tried to repeat it in a laboratory up in uh, uh, Canada, and what he found was there's a 16.39% drop in milk production after two weeks of exposing these cows to high frequency. Well, in the real world, we don't go ahead and get a chance to uh, expose it for only two weeks. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Dr. Graham did some, uh, put some chicks, in, or eggs in an incubator, and you could see the chick on the right, and then the chick on the left was exposed to basically the same signals like a Dell laptop computer would put out. And he did it only for, uh, on the 10th day, for 30 minutes. Now I was a little bit upset about that, <clears throat> because I thought I wanted to see some results, and I thought you gotta do it longer. But there's a reason he's a professor and I'm not. And he only did it for that amount of time. And you can see the results. And the chicks were bad, bad birth defects, deformed. And you can see it's all brown and burnt here and you know, deformed leg. And this is the one, the, the healthier one. So we took this information, we went up to Moscow, and then Dr. Yuri Gregoriev did it in an incubator there, repeated it. And you can see the numbers here. Only this time we put a filter. We've, we've exposed the chicks 24 hours or for longer periods of time, but we put on two incubators and one was a control. And only one, we just exposed them, but we put a filter to clean it. And you can see what happens with the filters. We had 81% hatch rate and the control was 75 and where it was exposed only 68. Blood sugar. So we have a, a meter, we monkeyed around, we knew that the blood sugar was correlated to this dirty power with people. And so what we needed to do was a measurement, a number. So Dr. Graham invented this meter and designed it and built it. And what happens is measuring the amount of energy that's, in this, that's on the wires. So what happens is the higher the number, the higher a person's blood sugar. The lower the number, the lower the blood sugar. Now that's not subjective, that's sort of like the cows. Okay, I mean, I don't think any, maybe the Dalai Lama can control his, knock his blood sugar down, uh, but I can't, and so then there was a, we presented it to the Bioelectromagnetic Society, and so there was a um, university there, and some people from Japan, and they went and they did uh, some research on it, and what they found was these higher frequencies caused the, um, it attenuates insulin. So it's, that's all the doom and gloom of it. So what about the solutions? Okay, so Charles DiNardo, he's the chief electrical engineer for We Energies in Wisconsin. He testified under oath that fortunately there are proven and relatively inexpensive techniques for addressing any type of ground current transients, including those that are in emit. So you know a little high frequency transients? First of all, remember, they're proven and relatively inexpensive. So the question is, why aren't they being used? Remember that book, the $25,000 book? Well, it says a method that practically eliminates ground currents associated with the primary distribution lines and still maintains the advantages of a four-wire multi-grounded system is to go to the five-wire system. They did that experiment, the New York Power Association, MEPRI did it in, in, out of one circuit in a substation in New York. They monitored for a year, they put up the fifth wire, they monitored for another year, and they found that there was a 40% reduction in what they call stray voltage or ground currents, and a 50% reduction in the EMFs. You can put another, the, the two neutral wires, you can just add one, or you can put a bigger one up. Remember the IEEE, it says, install filters to control harmonics through the higher frequencies. Install a new feeder, which would be that. So there's plenty of literature out there. They did put it up in Wisconsin, uh, they put a new line up. There was some farmers that had some problems. Uh, electric utility did put it up. Nobody along that line, there were seven farmers along the line, and all, none of the farmers had less than a 20 pound per day increase in milk production per cow. Hmm. And that transfers in, uh, translates into money. Again, there's a reason that Dr. Graham is a professor. So we've seen this stuff on the line. We went to manufacturers of, company, of, of equipment. And they said, well, they'd add $5 to the cost of it. They don't want anything to do with it. So Dr. Graham makes this filter, invents a little filter, and it takes out the, the high frequency. And it's nothing new. It's a capacitor. The filter's nothing new. It wasn't something that, you know, uh, 
come up out of the blue. It's not voodoo or anything else. Here's a book called Power Quality Reference Guide. It's put out by Ontario Hydro. And you can see it says put in power line filters. And you can see the schematics and drawings of it. So again, uh, we were doing work in Russia, in Kazakhstan, places like that. In the Republic of Kazakhstan, uh, we use an oscilloscope, and that's like here, and you can see that. So again, we needed to develop a meter that their health department could use to go out because they didn't want to supply everybody with this. Because in there, in those countries, if you come in with these set of symptoms, um, they don't say, okay, you got chronic fatigue, here's some pills, you got fibromyalgia, here's some pills, or whatever. What they do is they say you got radio wave sickness, and they send somebody out with what they call a B&E meter, and they send them out on a rooftop, and they're looking for somebody who put up a cell tower somewhere or something. So what happened is they never looked at what was on the wires in the wall. So when they seen that, they said, oh my gosh, this is a tremendous amount of energy, but we can't afford to have people uh, buy scopes and things like that. So Dr. Graham makes this little meter here, and handheld, digital, doesn't take batteries, anything, relatively simple. And so they adopted this meter as an official meter, and they said if the number's over 50, you have to take immediate steps to reduce it, and there's a national decree there. Here's a young lady in Russia, or Kazakhstan, this is a physicist, and you can see there's a receptacle here along the wall, and we actually are reading, this is a meter they have, it's called a beating meter, and we're reading three volts per meter here. And what happened is there's a receptacle here. She's about a foot away from the wall. So then we put a filter in. She didn't move. And we put this filter in. And it dropped to two immediately. And then it went to zero. So then we took the filter back out again. And she charges up again. So that's what's inside. I don't know what's inside of her. That's what's coming here. OK? So here's a school. And you can see how crappy it was. Remember that 12.5 kilohertz? OK, so now here it is. And you can see that waveform, how it changed. So there's a whole lot less energy there. The amplitude is lower, and the frequency is lower. It's spread out. It's like one kilohertz. We put them in a school in, in uh, Melrose Mindoro School District in Wisconsin. Uh, the school is being sued by the teachers' union for sick building syndrome. Uh, they had a lawsuit filed by the teachers' union. And uh, I was asked to go there. We checked it out. We put in these filters kind of as a last resort for them because they have the state health department and everybody there. And they never looked at electrical. And what happened is everybody got better. Uh, people with MS, their symptoms went away. or compl uh, They complained of MS and were diagnosed with MS. And uh, 37 students had asthma and no longer had asthma within 30 days. And you can see here's another one here. This is New Richmond's West Elementary School. They have 102 teachers, and now 33 of them have cancer in the last five years. That's statistically significant. The health department will not look at electrical. However, they have looked at mold and everything else. Where is that? New Richmond, Wisconsin. It's up by Minneapolis. Why school? Schools have, why schools? Good question. Schools have a lot of energy efficient lights in. They got a rebate. You know, if you put in an energy efficient light, yeah. um, they, they have computer labs, you know, where there's a lot of tremendous amount of computers in a small room, you know, probably get 100 computers in this room or something. So uh, schools are, and that's where we send our kids, and you remember, you know, they're young cells, developing cells, and so cell always duplicates itself. <laughs> Here's another one. And the people in this room actually have cancer, and kind of, these are rooms that people actually did have cancer in, and you can see you know, the crap here, or the noise, or the high frequencies, and here it's spread out. This school here, um, they put them in, and they used to budget $90,000 a year for equipment repair. When they put them in, this, this doesn't care about the amplitude, it's looking at for high frequencies, and so if you have a power or surge suppressor, they have like a clamping voltage of 180 volts, until it gets above that, it's not going to do anything, where the filters will take out much lower voltages and causes less stress on your equipment. Mm -hmm. And they haven't spent more than $4,000 in the last, now it'll be four years. Uh, Dr. Magda Havas, a professor at Trenton University in Canada, had done some research on five different schools, and she found that the symptoms improved for 55% of the teachers. Teachers were less frustrated, less tired, less irritable, they were better able to focus and had better health improvements, moods, better self, uh, better sense of accomplishment. Now, she did this and um, 
there was five schools, uh, five different studies, so it's re repeated. Uh, she presented her findings here at the International Conference of Childhood Leukemia in London, and she said improvements were, are associated with fewer and less severe headaches, more energy, lower blood sugar levels for diabetics, and improved balance for those with multiple sclerosis. Results are observed within a matter of hours or days. We did have some filters made that are placebos. They do nothing. They look like it the same weight, everything just not connected in the inside. So it was a you know, a blind study or test. So this is a poster that they, she presented. Uh, Graham Stetzer filters enable people to improve power quality in their home and work environment and scientists to study the effects of dirty electricity. Workshop in Prague <coughs> in 2004, as much as 50% of the population may be hypersensitive. Children may be more sensitive than adults. I, that's her finding, she's a scientist, she's the professor. But I kind of question that. I think everybody, in my experience, is electrically sensitive. I just don't think that people recognize why they're sensitive. Even people like Stan didn't think he was sensitive. And I can see it. And now that, now that he recognizes it and notices when you're in a clean environment, you know, you don't know you're getting sunburned until you come out of the sun. Uh, Trenton University, poor power quality can be contributing to electrical hypersensitivity. Um, we presented some information to an uh, organization in Milan, Italy in April and there was a committee established uh, to report to the British government and they were going to report this month officially and what it came up with is the International Agency for Research on Cancer classes the smog as a possible uh, human carcinogen. There, it's likely to cause up to 30 percent of all childhood can cancers. Uh, there is an increase in evidence that the smog causes people to become allergic to electricity, leading to nausea, pain, dizziness, depression, difficulty in sleeping and concentrating. Uh, both the World Health Organization and the HPA accepts the condition exists, and the UN body <clears throat> eliminate, or estimates up to 3% or up to 3 in every 100 people are affected by it. Invis invisible smog created by the electricity that powers our civilization is giving children cancer, causing miscarriages and suicides, and making people allergic to modern life. This has to be a cooperative effort. The solution to this problem requires that. Uh, utilities need to update their outdated distribution lines to meet today's technological loads. And consumers need to reduce the amount of RF energy they're putting on the electrical wires. So. Can we enjoy the benefits of electricity? Can we use it safely? Is technology available to accomplish this? And can we achieve it with a minimum expense? The answer is yes. Um, I want to show you one little thing here. We're going to go down here. I want to show you this uh, is what's on. I had a filter plug in. You see this here? This is what's on this wire right here. This is what we're sitting in, this is the environment that we're sitting in here tonight. And you can see how the amplitude is kind of like off the screen, and you see how close they are together here, the red lines. And this is 1 60th of a second, like from here to here, and this is all the crap. Now I can put in a filter, and this number here is reading 1,716. And what we found so far with research, if the number gets above 35, it affects your blood sugar. If the number goes above 30, it will change the pH in your saliva. Now these are numbers that can be plotted against numbers, so whether you feel good or not, you know, that, um, we'll plug one in, it's loading up, there you go, that's one. And the number goes down to, what, 85? And you can see how it cleans it up. If you took measurements around the outlets of the room now, would you be getting a higher reading? Is that only yeah. Uh, yeah. outlet yeah. specific that you're yeah. talking about? Uh, let me have Martin Graham take care of some of this. You got it, Mike? Or not? Yeah. Yeah, generally, I should mention one thing that's peculiar in that normally an electrical filter has more than one component. 
Usually it's got an inductance and a capacitance. One picked up in series with the wires and the other one shunting across it. And it would be better to make the filters that way. But then you couldn't plug them in. You'd have to have an electrician come in, cut the wires in the wall, add the filter inductance, and then add the capacitance. The nice thing about these is it uses the inductance that's already in the wires in the building. And the capacitor is chosen so that that combination does this attenuation. So the thing that's different about this than other systems is anybody can buy the filters, assuming they have not money, but it's not it's less than the doctor bills you normally pay. And usually they plug in about 20 in a normal size house, let's say 2,000 or so square feet. And that does, of course, a better job than just the two. So one of the real contributions is this is something that people can buy themselves and install themselves. And the difference in cost of not needing a licensed electrician to change the wiring in your house makes a tremendous difference. You had a question. Did you say how many in a normal size house you'd need? About 20 is what we found. How, how long do they last? Indefinitely. That's one reason some people don't want to get into this business. There's no replacement parts. <laughs> now, you asked one question. Um, if we went around the room, it was like 1900 or something over there. And then this one here is like 1600, 1700, okay? And if you look at this, can you hold that up for a minute for me, please? Thank you. Um, what you do in one room affects another. So you don't need one in every receptacle, okay? So you want to go to where the culprits are. So one of the culprits we have right here now, of course, is just light, and we got this electric, you know, this computer. And I'm plugging this in over here, different circuit, okay? What happened to the number? 063. Yeah, went down to 63 right. from 1700. If, if so you, what happens in one part of the house affects the other, but yes, they're all different. But it's even worse than that. If you live in a rural or in a community with a whole bunch of houses, let's say with 80 foot frontage, and they run off one distribution transformer, or it comes in at 12 kilovolts and then gets reduced down to 240, and then there are three big wires and each of the houses is hooked in. If you fix up your house, your neighbor feels better. <laughs> <laughs> you can take a dimmer switch, and you can go, a light dimmer switch is terrible. And you can plug it in, and you can vary this dimmer switch and watch this number go up and down. Now, the dimmer switch is on a lighting circuit, but your receptacle is on a power circuit. But you can go to the neighbors, and you can call the neighbor up and say, hey, Watch this, it's very your dimmer switch. <laughs> and you can tell them where his dimmer switch is by reading this number. I've got a question for you. Um, one of the big problems in schools was the electronic, uh, electromagnetic ballast they were using with the uh, fluorescent lighting. And that's what they were causing a lot of problems with illness with kids and uh, lupus and MS and all that. Because we saw that a lot with our patients working under those conditions. Now, would that uh, help? If you plug it into the wall, would that control the uh, the uh, field that's coming out of the ballast and the, uh, the fluorescent light? Generally, the ballast is supposed to keep things like this from coming out. Yeah. And uh, if you put it in metal conduit, generally, you can pretty well protect it. They said one of the main things that Dave and I found is these fields vary with distance. Yeah. And originally they thought the fields came from the transmission lines outside the house. And the original people said, electric fields don't go through walls, but magnetic fields do. Mm -hmm. So for 20 or 25 years, all the research was concentrated on magnetic fields. And generally, they don't have nearly as much high-frequency compound. The thing that they overlooked is the wires outside the house are connected into the house through wires, and it brings it right through with no trouble. Now, you're normally not right next to all the wires in the walls, but the worst seems to be when you plug in a toaster. Oh. Not, not even a microwave, but a toaster, a flat iron, and 
particularly in kitchens, your hands are very close to the wires with no shielding on them. The other place that seems to be particularly dangerous is if you have a PC and it's plugged in yep. for charging on a strip of, say, six contacts. And plugged into it, in addition, is your fax machine and your copy machine, Everything. and your feet are right up against the wires. <laughs> Those are the, if you're going to find only two or three of these, you should plug it into that strip. Yeah, and even better is don't sit there. You plug one filter into that strip? No, there's a, you can get the instructions off the internet, but what we found, you can see here how I plugged one in, it made a major reduction. You need two, two for every computer. Plasma TVs, plug three in. But that's why we have the meter, because you don't really know, okay? But with the meter you can tell, but until then we had some instructions, you need to plug two in the computer, otherwise you're gonna chase your tail, and you'll never get your numbers below 60, okay? So you wanna get it below 30. Now. Um, that's what the research is going to show, and uh, some of the papers aren't published yet. But then you go around, what I usually tell people is, you know, if you can get close to the main panel, so that you can get rid of the crap coming from the neighbors first, that would be good. And then if you can go and get, like, your TV, your, your PCs, you know, major electronic equipment, then go ahead and go to your bedroom where you're spending six hours a day and go through the house that way. And you plug the meter in, and you're going to get a number. You plug the filter in, and the number will go down. Now, if it goes down significantly, you need one there. And let's define it significantly as 20%. So if it's reading 300, it goes down to 100, you obviously need one there. If it's reading 100, it goes down to 95, you don't need one there. But if it's reading 20, it goes down to, to 15, you need one there. But you see, you want to get the numbers low as you can, but you don't. You won't end up with one in every receptacle or anything like that. And there's some stuff on StetzerElectric.com. You can get the instructions. Well, what is your website? StetzerElectric.com. You can go there, and the instructions are there. It's more of a technical website. Do you have the main panel fixed there, too? The main panel, it's nice if you can get a, a receptacle on A and on B phase. There's two hot wires coming into the main. Okay, if you get one there, then it kind of stops the stuff coming from the neighbors and a little bit of it don't have to go into each one. But you can't plug it in, do you? What? You can't plug it in. You no, can. you put a receptacle there. You get most receptacles. You just put in a receptacle and then one you plug a, it in. One on A, one on B phase. Where? You have to put a receptacle in. Right by your main panel, you know? But most of the people don't have to do that. If, yeah, the big breaker panel. Yes, sir. Most of the people don't have to do that. 90% of the people could just go through the house and do like the computer and what it says, okay? Um, if you can't get, but we want to get the number below 30, okay? So then if you get it down to 40 or something like that, where you can't get it down, I was at stands today, um, house was perfect last night, really good, you know, in the teens, 20, low 20s in the teens, and all of a sudden this morning at 7 o'clock, it's up to 40. But he didn't do anything. Nothing was on. Because of the neighbors. The neighbors are up, yeah, getting ready to go, all the old switching on it, okay? So, in his case, if he wants to keep it below, he can go ahead and put it on. But it was there for about eh, 20 minutes or something like that, and then it's back down to 24. So, you know, it's up to him to... You know, so, so you're not, you're not isolating him with a close building? No, no. In fact, when Dave was first looking at these in Wisconsin, the rural area, it had a pattern of going up in the morning and then down. It depended whether the people went to work early or not. Then it was down for a lot of the day. And then it went up at supper time and TV time. And then it went down. But on Friday nights and Saturday nights, it went up and stayed up. And if it was a football game, it went up after the football game and stayed up for quite a while. Super Bowl Sunday, you yeah. gotta move out. Let me say one thing about that. People ask, 
why don't we do a double blind study? Which implies not two people in the study, but hundreds. And that takes money. And you can't get the money to do this kind of research. I understand. Now, no, let me say one other thing. Our approach has been that you shouldn't really believe the stuff in the medical literature. <laughs> or, the, or, or, the, or that the utilities put out. In fact, that anybody puts out. If you want to be sure of something, you should do the experiment yourself. Right right. And one of these things is, you can do this experiment as an individual. And if you feel appreciably better, then that's the answer you want. The hell with what it does to your neighbor. He may feel better because of what you did. But if you can do something and you see a result that's worth the money that it took, then you do it. Now, one other point. If you are sick because of where you work and you fix up your house, it's not going to take care of you. You've got to fix up the place that you work also. But you can do a test to see if this does make a difference. And the test is you put in and get this pollution of 1,600 up to 3,000 and see if you feel worse. Then, and, and, Yeah. I'm looking for a mechanism of action and inside the body. If you if you have a, you have noise in the line there, which is, is always noise on every electrical system. Not that much noise, well, not those frequencies. Well, that, well, the point is, if, okay, you're measuring that. That's still one step removed from something that's hurting someone through some radiation mechanism. It's not right. radiation. It's capacitive conduction right to the body. Yeah, but we're but but you're measuring a lot of noise a bolt on noise voltage. Noise on a line, that's still not really what. Sure, it is. When you go and you grab it, it goes through you. And they do the measurements. You can put two electrodes on yourself, say the ankle and the hip, and you measure the, uh, the DC and the IR drop. And you can amplify it and hear it. And you can hear it go up and down as you get close to the wires of the process. The skin does not generate this stuff. And when you turn off the breakers in the house, you don't hear it. When the breakers are on and the power is on the wires, you hear it more when you're close to the wires. And particularly if you have a dimmer switch, and you go near that, you hear it much louder and with a somewhat different character. I still haven't convinced you of anything. I have an open mind, but you've got to <laughs> no, you don't have to meet me halfway. You do the experiment. If you feel better, leave them in. If you don't, I, I'm not talking about why it does it to you. I'm doing talking about a cause and effect. Without talking to, to people who say this has a certain effect on a certain cell membrane, and it therefore does that. There are there are publications that talk about that but it doesn't prevent people from being sick or dying. So I, I know what those in the work I do. Yeah. I, I have a simple question, uh, maybe related to this first part. Uh, let's assume you have a house and you put all those filters on it, so then you have a little or nothing on the line. But I'm still using my laptop with all the display and such things. What, what is that laptop by itself doing? Is so the ratio is it is it much higher design. than the line or? Look, they just recall four million batteries. So they should have known what they were doing again. It's not that it put out electric fields, it just started fires. Uh, it's not so. only battery, but, uh, but also the electronics inside and the display itself. I'm saying it depends on the particular PC you're talking about and how the power supply is built in it. But your practical experiences, is the you laptop I don't have equivalent a of... Uh, I, have one. I have just a little experiment here that I can show you. I got this little op amp, and you can hear this. All right, I want you to squeeze your hand. Okay, that's the DC current from the brain. Now I'll just pick up that cord. Okay. 
take out the two filters. Take out the filters now. between her leg and her IV KG patches on her, one on her wrist and one on her hand. So one of the things I have a patent on is when we were working on cows, it's hard to tell when the cow is being shot. And the only number you have is how much milk she has. So we built this to hook on to the cow's ankle and get and tell them to eat it out. And then we could tell that the cow was getting shot when she, in some cases when she came from outside the barn to inside. Because there were two separate slabs of concrete with different reinforcing rods. And there was actually a voltage between those two. We would have never found it measuring it with probes. So the cow essentially told us where the problem was. I got a comment and a question. Um, for the engineer guy, uh, Robert Becker, who they mentioned, Robert O. Becker, yeah. when he talked about microwave irradiation coming from all kinds of sources like microwave ovens, he said the effects that they were finding on biological systems was like ionizing radiation at the other end of the spectrum, like the damage from gamma radiations, gamma radiation, etc. And he said they don't know why it causes that at the time that he wrote that book, which was maybe 20 years ago. But he said it was akin to taking a glass flyswatter swatter and hitting a submarine with it and sinking it. They didn't understand the, phys you know, the, the physics of it, but the physiological damage caused by microwave irradiation that they were seeing was like stuff from gamma rays. So that, that's my comment as far as mechanisms and understanding of it. But the question, question, what if you're running a negative ion generator? I would think that that would make the conductivity in the room much higher by using that. Depends on who built the ionizer. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> no, really. Because often it's not the ions, but the power supply yep. that runs the ion generator. <coughs> People put them in and they generate negative ions and they feel great. Hold on. Uh, there's a city in Arizona where they say there are certain spots where there's high generation of ions, positive and negative. I happen to go back there with an instrument that measures ionization from a company that builds ionizers for semiconductor production. The main difference I saw was in the motel room. <laughs> but people, if you, if you believe that that kind of ionizer helps you either by going to that particular spot. I think you should just get it. Yeah. Well, ionizers knock dust out of the air. They help rarefy the air, but at the same time, you've got a lot of negative ions in the air, which I assume would make the room more conductive. So you might be countering the effect but, of but these that filters. Conductivity, by running that conductivity is trivial yeah. to the capacitive impedance when you get your hand close to the wire. Go ahead. We live in the city of Mountain View, which is the Bulls headquarters. Google, you know, the, the Google, okay. <coughs> they have to um, the city of Mountain View. They're providing free Wi-Fi throughout the city. Yes. Yeah. 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 Is that a bad my own feeling is the content that's transmitted is far more damaging than the fuels. I have to one too. I haven't been hearing much in the audience. The, the energy involved in this kind of troubling to people is much greater. I've been. Stan, uh, uh, Stan, you can take care of that. Um, well, you know, on, on the day site, it's, uh, it's thirty dollars a filter, but they said uh, tonight, if you're interested in doing an experiment, and I, I've worked with people at several places around the country because a lot of people are skeptical; they don't know, they haven't any knowledge of this. And I would say, okay, look, you buy a meter, measure your house. 
by maybe one or two two filters, and then see what the differences are. Where do we buy? Uh, you can, we give you a phone number to, to contact. You can, you can contact, uh, you can get a hold of me. It's 925-373-3152. You want to repeat that? 925-373-3152. And I'll help you, again, re-educate yourself. It took me a long time to really understand what was happening here. And when my body took over, then I realized that some of the things that were happening to me, like falling asleep in class, uh, brain fog, uh, antsy, can't sleep at night. I could not figure out why, and I've taken all the supplements and all the orthomolecular stuff to balance out my body and still wouldn't work. Uh, then we created uh, like a safe haven at my house. I really hate to leave my house. Yeah. I hate to leave. Yeah, I said, oh, it's nothing, just to help to save the computers and things like that. She, now she's a functioning human being again. She didn't realize how, what, what the effects of those electromagnetic frequencies, how they were bothering her. One thing I should mention, though, is that when you said get one or two or something like that, don't plug one or two in and leave it plugged That's right. In, because you're not going to get better. You're not going to notice the difference in one or two. Right. You need to do kind of the whole treatment. You need to bring those levels down below. 30. You have to, what I discovered through Dave's advice and Dr. Graham's advice, that I had to go, and it took me a while, 45 minutes to do my house, to, to go through the house and find out key locations so I can get optimum use of those filters. So now my house, I know, is down, is at a safe level. You can walk into my house any time. How many filters do you have? Uh, and my house is a big house. It's almost 4,000 square feet. So I have about, uh, I think it was 32 filters in the house. So the cost is really minimal compared to what the negative effects of living in that environment. When I go to a hotel, I went to a hotel in Brentwood, uh, and it was a high-rise building. I lay down on the bed and I, and I said to Mary, there is something wrong with this room. Because I've become very sensitive yeah. now to this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, get the meter out. And we travel with this filters and meters. The room pegged the meter, just like it did this, this evening in this particular room. And I immediately put four filters. I didn't bring enough in. And then I, I only had two filters for my daughter-in-law. It was in the room next door. And not enough to cool the room down. But she started <coughs> coughing. And uh, she said, it's just an allergy. I said, OK. The next day, she's getting worse and worse. And the third day, she comes out with a cold. It affects, when I found out, it affects your immune system. It suppresses <coughs> your immune system 100%. in such a way that you can't even relate cause and effect. And this engineer said, what? Does this cause and effect? You know, it affects everybody <laughs> differently. And, and in a year that Dave and, and Dr. Graham took me on this ride for one year, I mean, I could not believe all the different things I found in people's houses. I've rewired my whole office. Oh, here, Clark. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, electromagnetic yeah. 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 Uh, uh, molecular um, uh, energies oh, uh, yeah. from ionizing radiation, yeah. where an electron will actually be ripped off a molecule to microwave radiation where all you're doing is causing molecules to uh, rotate and vibrate and, um, and, and torsional vibrations and those are all microwave frequency um, uh, uh, transitions. So all of the molecules in your body that are, have angles and connections to each other, they are all microwave absorbers, every one of them. So there's a mechanism of action there. Now, how that translates into biological effects is not that clear, but it is a subtle kind of heating effect. And there have been measurements that, that suggest that this is, these kinds of molecular vibrations are critical when you're dealing with receptor substrate interactions that where the receptor and substrate are nanomolar concentrations are less, that these 
kinds of changes in vibration affect those binding reactions. Let me add one thing to that. In experiments where they put in a single radial frequency or high frequency, whatever one you're working with, at a constant amplitude, it has much less effect of this kind than if the amplitude is changing. And it's very much, I believe, like an AM radio. Yeah. Where you have 740 kilohertz, if you have only that, you don't hear it on your radio. It's the amplitude modulation. And, and this is... Huh? It's having different frequencies combined together. Yeah, they can be, the give you the same kind of thing, yeah. You had a question here. You said the uh, one could trace 30 dollars, and uh, what about the meter? Meters. Uh, you had mentioned that um, your neighbors, uh, the, the way your neighbors raise or lower things uh, could change yours once you had your outlets plugged in your, your but filter. It doesn't change you as much if your house is fixed up. If your house is fixed up, but no, I live in a house by myself. You can tell when they get up, <laughs> where they start doing things with the equipment in the kitchen. But I live in a house by myself, and it's, uh, in front of me and behind me is a two-story apartment complex all the way around me. So there's like 150 units. Is it going to be hard for me to filter my house out? No, I so many. Hard. I don't think so. I don't it's of course if you're in the apartment building and it's the people in the apartments next to you because it's the power comes in and up to all of them. But separate houses, I think, it wouldn't be that bad. When you are in the apartments, like when my kids went to college, you know how kids are in the dorm rooms, you know, every electronic device in six counties come to this one little 10 foot square room. And I couldn't get the levels down in their room, so we went to the room next door, on each side. We still couldn't get it where we wanted, but it was still lower, and my kids all graduated on a dean's list, so they were probably. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Stan came to our house, and I didn't realize what kind of electric smog we had. And I have four in the bedroom, and I sleep much better. So it's cause and effect. I don't know how it works, but it works, and I want to know if I can buy some more. The thing people say most, they talk to him. After they're installed, Often the next day they say they really had a good night's sleep, first time in months. The other thing is that they dream. Yeah. They, when I went to her house, the interesting thing about her house is I measured her entire house, and her bedroom measured uh, 1650. But the, the living room where they sit, which also was pretty hot, measured 700. And I said, why would that room measure 1650? Of course, it was the way the house was, uh, was uh, probably wired. But outside our house, 75 feet away, is a power pole. And remember, the power pole has a grounding rod. And the grounding rod's going in. And for some reason, that part of her bedroom, and I said, well, how long have you lived in this house? She says, well, I don't know, 15, 20, I don't know, whatever. It is a long time. Now, the interesting thing about that, she next day when I called you, right, I said, how did you sleep? She said, I slept better. What, what else? She said, I had less pain. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, I can't, I don't, can't guess this stuff. I'm not a medical doctor. It's, it was a, her, her experience. She didn't know what was going to happen. Okay, wait. Yes, uh, I have two things to say. First of all, my brother had twins, and at seven, one of his daughters went into an unexplained coma. And uh, this was in Southern California. And uh, she remained in a coma for uh, three and a half weeks. And they kept transferring her to different medical centers. She finally ended up at Loma Linda. And one doctor at the end said, where is her bed? And is it next to an electrical outlet? Is that where her head is? My brother said yes. So they called PG&E in uh, to measure all the outlets in the house, in the bedroom. And where her head was, was off the chart. Now, you can all do this. pg e will come out and measure for nothing. Yeah. The downside is that becomes a disclosure when you sell your home. <laughs> so it's much better to do it yourself. There's one more downside. Anybody ever go to the doctor with a fever? Okay? And you go in with a fever and then use a blood pressure cup to check it with and say go home, you don't have a fever. <laughs> it's sort of like pg e coming out with a Gauss meter and they're looking at the 60 cycle component and there's nothing there. 
Okay, you're not going to find it. You're not going to find a fever unless you use a thermometer. You got to use an oscilloscope. You got to use something or this meter or whatever to see what you know the high frequency component. Go ahead. Um, the, the damage, I believe, is being done by radiation. Is that right? No. 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 The radiation, from my point of view, is a radio wave traveling in, in space with no wires. Well, so is this traveling in space, isn't it? No. It's not the radio wave. It's plain electrical capacitance coupling. The thing is that people normally think you only get these currents if you actually touch the bare wire. At these frequencies, you don't have to touch it. If you get Why don't we measure the radiation then? We don't. We're measuring. The needle measures essentially what comes from the wires on these cords through the air and through you. It doesn't measure the voltage. It measures the current that it thinks is going through you. But it doesn't get it exactly right because it doesn't know how far away you are. Right. <laughs> That's what's important. Yeah. Just, we can make it so that you always have a tape measure. That we, <laughs> but then it would depend on the construction of the wire. The extension cord. I'm still not clear on what, like the plasma TV, what, what is it, it's dirty energy, it's, it, do I say too much electrical energy and electrical magnetic, or no, no, what all, is it? All the spots in the plasma display are like radio transmitters, like Marconi used to go from England to the U.S., to Newfoundland. They're really spark transmitters, and before they knew how to do the other stuff, it was spark transmitters. Sparks generate very high frequency, and sparks that were generated the radio waves that went through space in the early days. And you have the equivalent of a whole bunch of them on your TV when plasma was, screen. Uh, How about LCD? And that when gives waterfall, less. Waterfall. Yeah, I've heard that it has a lot of ions. If you're, if you're by a waterfall. That's all. It is different. Yeah, it is different. But the yeah. other man was talking something about Conductance. air conditioners bringing down. The negative ions, which may be it was good. the air conditioning, the air conditioning units often done it because they have motors in them, and the motors generate this kind of stuff. The time. Extra electricity and, and yeah. bring down. Go ahead. Um, what frequency range does your meter measure? It starts indicating stuff when you. Actually, it doesn't measure frequency. It measures the rate of change of, vol of voltage with time okay. instead of voltage. And uh, the general uh, range in this meter is around seven, around 10 kilohertz to, I think, 400 kilohertz. And it pays more attention to the higher frequencies than the lower. Now, I was going to say something. Um, Hans Nieper. When he used to, um, when we used to work with him and his cancer patients in the 80s, he always had to have every house measured for the frequency for the, you know, if their heads were near the gap, you know, the uh, outlets, because 60 cycles have been shown, and I, I saw the studies done, and I called the uh, head researcher that 60 cycles causes cancer. That's why in Europe you see 50 cycles rather than 60. And well. They also well, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Did they look at that 60 cycle waveform and take that out? Or are we just going to Mexico and saying water got sick? Because no, everybody no, in Mexico I, I got sick in the water. What they did is they put these animals' mouths in a, uh, an environment that was right next to a circuit that had 60 cycles. Yes, water. like how clean or dirty was that 60 cycle? In That's other words, true. did we take distilled water and give it to the rats? Or did we go ahead and give it to water in Mexico and there was a bacteria that kid did it? I'm not questioning, this. you know, I just have that question because what I'm seeing here is when we went into buildings and we put these into schools or anything, we didn't change the 60 cycle. No, we actually increased it because these things draw 0.9 amps of reactive power. You're not paying for it because your light bill doesn't go up, so don't worry about that. But so the 60 cycle actually increased. 37 kids have asthma, no longer asthma. People who have MS, and I, I should bring that up here uh, while you're answering some more questions, but. Uh, where Dr. Havis did some research with MS patients. And we didn't change anything, just the, you know, not the 60. Go ahead. So did I see in the slideshow the um, filter helps make other power supplies more efficient? Well, what it did is it helps your equipment. It helps your equipment. Yeah. Work better. 
Well, yeah, sure, you're going to clean your power, but you're not having these spikes aren't going into the equipment. You know, when they first started selling desktop computers or portables, if, when they were first selling PC computers or desktops, and you took one into your office, if you were next to the elevator, electric elevator, it kept crapping out. But they didn't clean the whole building. They put the filter inside the computer. <laughs> Are you saying this so, corrects power factor? What? It corrects power factor? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the power factor can become atrocious. I mean, what, this system corrects power factor. No, this makes it worse. Makes it worse. What it means is that, that you don't pay anymore. Because your power, your watt hour meter in almost every home doesn't look at the power factor. That's only done in industrial instances. But the plus side is that the extra current that has to be delivered, when it comes through the utility lines, is a loss to them and it costs them money. Sure. That's a side benefit. Yeah. <laughs> what, what about um, the safety of the movers? They're T8 plus lengths that are at 20,000 20, hertz. I think we, I haven't looked into it, but generally the fluorescent no, lights. What I'm getting at is you know, this is different frequency. Oh. I'm trying to get at what, no, you're, what you're saying is it the cleanness of it or is it the frequency of it? Because these oh, it's both. It's both. don't cause nearly as much headache as it, it. It's both. And the thing is, like on the high efficiency fluorescent lamps that you can buy to replace an incandescent bulb. No, no, I want you to talk about. 20,000 hertz, the specific T. I, I don't really know for those. Because I want to know, see, those are high frequency. Is that high frequency dangerous? Or if they're clean, that's not a problem. I'm trying to get an understand whether this is the cleanness of the spikes or whether it's the frequency of it. If you're measuring the rate of change of voltage, it depends on both the amplitude and the frequency. And this means if if you have a certain amplitude at 100 kilohertz and half that amplitude at 200 kilohertz, it measures the same thing. And we believe that its effect on people is about the same. Let me just show you something here. Dr. Magda Havis did some research, and the papers aren't printed yet, so but this is some slides, because the results were so dramatic that she actually made a film of it. Okay, started filming it. And this is a young man here, and, and I'm sorry, I apologize, but it isn't very clear. Uh, the first one, but he has MS, diagnosed with MS. He got fired from his job because he kept stumbling and falling over and he thought he was drunk and he failed, he didn't pass, uh, I mean, he didn't fail any drug tests, but they would give him these drug tests and he passed them, and, but they said, you must be drunk or something, you're fired. So you can see him walking down the hall, he kind of staggers and you got to look a little bit careful there, but, and he had to move in with his parents and you can see there's a, there's a, on the wall, there's a rail, and so he got in this study through the, uh, the it's in Canada, through the, the MS Society or something up there, and four days later she goes back, and this is him walking down the hall. Now, he got his job back, and he's working, and he's fine, and he goes down to the pub and has a few beers and with his buddies and whatever, so he's got kind of like his life back. This was a woman here, who I think she's in her late 30s or something, and th there's no exaggeration here. Her hands, she would sit on her hands when she went there. And she has these tremors. And basically it's uncontrollable. Her mother takes care of her during the day and her husband takes care of her at night and she has a daughter. And so 12 days later, she said they didn't help her. She didn't feel that there was any help there. But anyway, this is her 12 days later. Now she takes care of herself and she's living at home and her mom still lives with her, but you can see the difference. That's with the installation of your... All they changed, it was a, yeah, the, they, they just put the filters in and they lowered the numbers. Now this is MS and those results are going to be uh, published hopefully soon, but uh, the, 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 the analysis is in. Go ahead, back there. If we went to BC, would it cure the problem? It shouldn't have a problem with BC. If you have the BC, if you have solar cells, and between the solar cell and your outlet, there's a converter that converts the DC to AC and then 
sends it out to the Apple. Those can be powerful. Behind the camera, <laughs> you'll never, you'll never even I'm see it. I was wondering, the easiest way if you, where the power comes up to your panel with the two, uh, two legs in the middle, you put the plug in on both sides and you plug one of these units in uh, both of them, that would solve everything, wouldn't it? That no, it won't. That we won't. tried that. We were there a long time ago. Okay, what do you do with your computer over in the room that's generating this stuff? What do you do with your uh, TV that generates this stuff? It's good for you, maybe. It yeah. doesn't take care of what you're It doesn't take care of what you're putting on the line. See? We tried it, believe me, and it didn't work. We got some results, but it wasn't very good. Yeah, if you have line C, you can for that, and you have a very uh, low immune system, which goes with line C. Will this help you uh, heal faster? I, I'm not credentialed to answer that. I'm sorry. I'm not a medical doctor. Can you imagine one experiment? Uh, let's say uh, everyone, um, everyone speaks uh, eight hours. Uh, eight hours. Eight hours to switch off the power for the whole home. I assume the effects which you are talking about are some cumulative. So would I get the better feeling already? So yes. as a proof that this in, method... There's a company in Germany that sells a different kind of circuit breaker such that if you have nothing connected on that line that the circuit breaker uh, is serving, it opens the breaker so there's no voltage on those wires. So you feel better as long as you turn everything off. If you, if you turn off all your appliances, the circuit breaker itself opens. So then it's a nice clean area. There are people that will, let's say, take their bedroom area and it's on a circuit breaker outside the house. And at nighttime, they'll go outside and turn off that circuit breaker. So the lights don't work, the radios don't work in the bedrooms, but they're electrical clean. My question is, how much the improvement could be expected? It varies from because person it's only eight hours a day. You know? it it's the eight hours that you're there. Sleep is a difference. It's the time of sleep. That's when your body repairs the Yeah. Dave? No. Oh, 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 okay. For years ago, they used to have these blockbusters. One meeting, please. They used to have what? They used to have these blockbusters, they were called, that you would plug into your electrical system that was supposed to neutralize the detrimental energy. And I wondered if you were familiar with this, you could speak to it. Uh, the reason I thought of this is because they were three prong, and I noticed yours is a two prong. When you have big ground currents, uh, the ground comes in through a water pipe and goes to your heating duct, big metal aluminum duct. You can clean up the voltage between the two wires and take out the trash. But if there's trash on the heating duct, you'll find get the field and the current through you from the two wires, even though there's no potential between them. If there's a potential between the two wires, and, the duct. and in fact, Dave's done measurements. If you're in a shower and the water supply and the drain are two different pipes going out of the house, they can have a voltage between them. Some people we know, there's one person, when they take a shower, they can hear a radio station. <laughs> yeah. So if you have the three plugs and you put the capacitors across the two that are normally considered the hot, of the hot, one of them is a neutral, should be grounded. But it doesn't mean it's the same potential exactly as the water. If in those cases you go and connect the capacity across that, it takes two capacitors, it's, uh, I don't know. I think in certain cases it would make a difference. But we've only been looking at the cases where you could keep the voltage, this trash, between the, off, between the two wires that you're close to. And even if it's a three-prong plug, if there's trash between those two wires and you're putting your hand on that wire, it will cause the current to go through. Yeah. I, 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 I assume it's less than 60 years ago that you're talking about, but I didn't hear about it at the time.
all this is, uh, they've been sold, uh, I think they're still being sold, but it's dead. Various plug busters. Plug busters. Plug busters, yeah. Okay. Energyworks123.com, you can learn about it and see what they have to say about it. That's the uh, dinner we talked about that, that electronics oh, fellow. Energyworks123.com. Um, just a quick question, when you're talking about the um, uh, one or two possibly in each power strip. I have two computers and one in each of them on the power strip. And I've actually had a lot of symptoms of things. Yeah. This is interesting, doing my own research. So if I hit the meter and um, I'm Then there, then there. You got four computers. Yeah, you got two computers. You need four capacitors just for the computers. How much? That's why Stan took so many more. You neglected to tell you he had several computers. You have one. Uh, I can shed a little bit of light on this mechanism for the coupling to the cells. I remember in 1960 reading a paper in the Russian literature in which people were looking at a, through a microscope at some cells on a piece of glass. The piece of glass had four electrodes on it. One pair of electrodes uh, opposing each other had a DC voltage on it. The other pair of electrodes, which is at right angles, had an AC voltage. The interesting thing that the Russians found was that when they put on an AC frequency below a certain threshold frequency, the cells would migrate in one direction. Above that frequency, the cells would migrate in the other direction. And even more interesting, instead of just having AC frequency stay straight AC, they could chop the AC so that there were bursts below the, the frequency of interest and above the frequency of interest, and the cells would know what frequency there was, even though the AC was chopped into small chunks. So this is a possible mechanism for coupling uh, of the <coughs> capacitive coupling to the cells. <coughs> and I must say, I find it a little hard to believe what I've heard here, uh, but I do remember that thing yeah. from the past. Let me add one thing. They showed the picture of the two chicks that were incubated, and I only put the trash on for a half hour on the tenth day, but you could see a difference in the, in the chicks. It, it, it's difficult to do experiments like that on humans. It's very difficult if you're at a university, because you have to have a committee to approve the experiment. It's much easier to do it on a friend or on yourself, but it's still it has a certain messy aspect. One other experiment that I did, similar to the chicks, is I bought a 10-gallon tank and some goldfish. And I had them in the water. And I had two metal plates at the end. If I put 60 cycles on and turned it up, the fish thrash around. It's clear that they're in pain at a certain point. If I put on high frequencies, they, and turned it up. They didn't thresh, thresh around. But after a while, they floated to the top. <laughs> and there was one other thing that was interesting, is since the plates were at the end, the field was across the length of the tank, the fish would turn. So they were perpendicular and got less of a field. Hmm. One other thing that really surprised me is I took one of these, a little tank, you know, when you have uh, fighting fish, you put it in the tank so it won't be eaten by the others. Mm -hmm. So I had a little tank and I put the field across that one, the high frequency one, and the fish became pretty, you know, it was clear that they weren't really healthy. They didn't move much and they were cold. But when I took them out of that tank, that little box, and they were floating, the other fish that hadn't been affected came up and helped guide it around and get it going. Hmm. There was a sociological aspect which the maze that had happened. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up there, guys. The, uh, this has been a tremendously uh, wow. well done presentation.
Professor Grimson is nine years in the preparation. And even so, you know, I don't know what to make of it, but it's certainly, it, 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 I think these guys are honest and uh, they, they're, they're going to be honest on the figure. Know. Phil, we want to know if we get a real stunt horse deal on this stuff. We've got to talk to Stan Durst, and he's a, he's a professional negotiator, but uh, but he's, he's also a nice guy, so, you know, there's Stan up there in the yellow shirt, so if anybody's Stan, interested. I do have six meters. Yeah. Okay. All right, see you all next time, I hope. What, what should Google give to people about Mountain View then? What should Google company give to people of Mountain View these filters? He doesn't. He has the study. Wireless. Wireless.